Alrighty then, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my version of the story of Jeff the Killer. Now, if you've looked this up online, you're probably well familiar with the original, or if you're looking up the original and you found my version, you can go ahead and look up the original uh, first and then read my version as a comparison, or you can read my version and then read the, or listen to my version here, and then look up the original as a comparison to mine, however you want to do it. Now, I know some of you seem to flip out if I talk very much before I get into the actual storytelling, but I wanted to uh, tell you why, <clears throat> pardon me, I decided to do my own version, my own rewrite, rework, remix, however you want to put it, of this particular story. And mainly it's because a lot of the creepypasta, they're good ideas in their core, but a lot of them are just horribly, horribly written. And it's, uh, just one little example is in the original Jeff the Killer, there is an incident at a bus stop with the kids waiting for the bus. Now, there's some local bullies that come into play, and Jeff's brother's first response is to jump up and about and start to get ready to punch one of them, okay? Now, I don't know about you, but to me, that is just too fast of an escalation towards violence. It really doesn't make sense. Most people are not going to just jump up and start throwing punches over what was talked about in that particular, you know, scenario. So there's, you know, there's just little things like that. Uh, the, you know, amateur writing, I know that's part of the whole creepypasta experience is that it's people who aren't, don't write a whole lot, writing stories that are supposed to be creepy. But there were just things like that, you know, the absolute horrible mangling of tenses is another thing, you know, when things take place and how they're described, that was a bit irritating through it. But really, a lot of it was just... You know, it was just a whole lot of little things that I read it, and I wanted to clean it up. I wanted to kind of tighten up the story, make it so it made a bit more sense. There was a bit more uh, connective tissue through the whole thing. The only thing that I would do differently with my version as it is now is that, because I did keep the basic story structure and the basic, the, you know, the core of the story, which I thought was good, it just needed to be cleaned up and given a bit more of a professional touch, if you will. Not saying that the original was just unreadable, it just needed some work, in my opinion, so I that's why I've done my own version of it. So, I'm going to go ahead and here pretty quick get into my version, because like I said, I know some of you seem to have no patience to just listen to someone talk about why they wrote a story or something. Or rewrote in this case. But uh, I will also say that this version relies a bit more on psychology. There is a bit more duh type of stuff rather than ooh type of stuff. I, I wrote some things deliberately in there to mess with you. Of course, it's a creepy story, but I also I find it a lot of times in horror and creepy types of stories, just little things to make you kind of go, oh man, you know, just those types of reactions. That's what I like to go for more than just flat out, oh yuck. Okay, you know what I mean? If not, think about it. So, a bit more psychological. I cleaned it up a bit. Here we go. My version of Jeff the Killer or Jeff the Killer Acid Heads Remix, if you will. Part 1. Oh, sorry. It will be in four parts, even though I'm doing it in one go, because uh, when I posted it to my forum, I had to put it in four different posts, because it was so long. Over 6,000 words. Okay, sorry. Here we go. Part 1, The Bedtime Killer. 
This is an excerpt from your local newspaper. Good news in the development of the bedtime killer case. After several weeks of the police being baffled, there was finally a break in the case. A young, young man survived an attack by the killer and has given the police a statement. At this time, the young man's name and his statement have not been released to us. They have, however, given us a description in order to keep the public aware and help them catch this murderer. Chief Williams is quoted as saying, The perpetrator has been described as having some resemblance to the Joker from the Batman series. Large eyes, possibly with black makeup or burns around them. A jagged, scarred-up mouth set in a perpetual grin. He is very pale and has unkept hair. Considering the state of the perp, uh, well, you can assume he knows how to stay out of sight. However, if you should see anyone matching this description, please do not approach him. Secure yourself and call 911 as soon as possible. I would also like to restate the earlier warnings that if you have children between the ages of 6 and 12, please do everything you can to secure them between the hours of 8 and midnight, as those are the ages of the children attacked and the time frame they took place in. So far, the killer has not shown any signs of changing his M.O. in response to our warnings. Thank you, that is all. Bobby was scared. Just like all the kids at school were scared. He looked at his clock. It was bedtime. After a long, long while, he finally fell asleep. He woke up from a nightmare and looked over at his clock. It was blinking twelve like the power had gone out. He looked around the room with bleary eyes and noticed the window was open. Wait. Not just open. Broken. He looked around again and noticed his closet was open. Just a little bit. And that's when every hair on his young body stood on end. Just barely, he could see eyes inside. Large, unblinking, dark eyes, just catching the moonlight as it poured through the busted-in window. For a long time, Bobby was too scared to move. Then he screamed. <coughs> that was when the door opened and the bedtime killer walked in. Bobby could hear his parents scrambling out in the hall trying to open the door. It was locked, and a chair was in front of it. Bobby looked up, and the killer was smiling at him. No. His mouth was cut up. The lips were kind of gone. His face had been mutilated into a permanent grin. And the eyes, too big in the man's head. Something was wrong with them. But Bobby didn't know what it was. He screamed again, and again. And again, and again, and again, as the man came closer, and closer, and closer. Not rushing, just a methodical advance. Finally, he reached Bobby and jumped on him. He bent down and slammed his hand over the boy's mouth, cutting off his screams. Bobby went deaf. Well, not really, but some part of his mind could hear his parents trying to bash the door down and screaming that the police were coming, but... Every last shred of his senses were fixed on the evil creature, once human but something less now, that set on him and held him firm. The killer bent down and licked Bobby's forehead and laughed gutturally. <laughs> As the smell of piss and shit filled the air. He got right down by Bobby's ear and said in a perfectly calm voice, Enough noise. Time to go to sleep. With that statement, he pulled a knife from his waistband. He poked it into Bobby's head and arms a few times, chuckling at each whimper. <laughs> it was a shiv. A long razor fixed to a handle of some sort with black tape. He brought the knife up and brought it down hard. Bobby woke up in the hospital. He had been stabbed, but survived. Just as the killer was bringing the knife down to pierce his heart, his father had broken the door down. That had been just enough to startle the killer into missing. Just. 
there had been a struggle, and Bobby's father, Bob Sr., had been had been slashed up pretty badly. His mother also had to have some stitches in her arms where the madman had slashed at her. He had still managed to get away, jumping through the patio doors like it was nothing and running off into the night as the sound of police sirens got closer. Too late as usual. Once the doctor cleared Bobby to speak, he told the police everything that I've told you now. Jeff the Killer, Acid Heads Remix, Part 2. Jeff. I have managed to piece together, I think, who the killer is. No one believes me. They all think he died a long time ago. But I remember the story. So I'm going to tell it to you. I had to piece it together from news reports, police files, psychiatric files. And I also admit that I had to fill in the blanks a lot to make it into more of a story than just a report to you on the facts. People listen to stories better than reports, I think. It's a story about a boy named Jeff. Jeff was just a kid, like any other kid. Thirteen, an eleven-year-old brother named Louis. Everyone called him Lou. But he did have a bad temper. A very bad temper. He was in care for his temper and had to take pills that kept him more, um, even. See, there had been an incident at his last school. Bad enough that they moved. New town, new meds, a place to start over. Fortunately, his dad had worked at a big corporation, and it hadn't been hard for him to get a promotion to head the local branch. The pay was only a little better, but his dad figured, what the hell, even if it caused him ten times the stress for only a little bit of better pay, as long as he was giving his son a chance to make good and get past what had happened, it was okay. They were unpacking their stuff when a neighbor came over. Hi, she said, and Jeff rolled, her, uh, rolled his eyes. Lou elbowed him. She had one of those high, fluting voices that all soccer moms seem to possess. My name is Barbara. Everyone calls me Barb. I live across the street from you, right over there. She had to point because it was one of those gated communities where every house looks identical. I wanted to come over and... Uh, Welcome you to the community, introduce myself, and, uh, if you will come over here, my son, Billy, she called out to a small boy about Blue's age, Billy, come over here and meet our new neighbors. Introductions went all around, and by the end of it, Jeff and Lewis were going to go to Billy's birthday party, along with their parents, of course. Jeff wanted to say he didn't want to go, but Lou seemed up for it, and he thought it would probably be rude to say something right there in front of the little twerp. Later on, when they were done carrying stuff in, Jeff found his mother and told her he didn't want to go to the party. Mom, why did you have to tell him that I wanted to go to that kid's party, that I had to go? I'm a teenager now. I can't hang around with little kids like that. Carol, his mother, sighed the sigh. Only a mother can know. The exasperated sigh of a woman long-suffering with... Sorry. The exasperated sigh of a long-suffering woman who really wishes her problem child would settle down a bit. Of course, this was just the usual kids growing up stuff. Not like... Well, best not to dwell on the past. Jeff, hun, we just moved in. We don't know anyone here yet. These communities expect the residents to get to know each other and do stuff together. That's the point of living in one. What, so I have to do it just because the community police think I should? Damn it, Jeff. This is a chance for your brother to get to know the local kids and your father and I to get to know some of the adults. You might meet some people your own age, too, you know. You aren't the only older brother in the world. You might even meet a pretty girl or two. She nudged him and smiled while he got embarrassed and shuffled his feet. Mom! 
Oh, go on then, and we are going to the party, so get used to the idea. Maybe try to look forward to going. You never know what good things might happen. Jeff was mad when he got to his room. It wasn't fair. Life wasn't fair. Nothing was fair. He didn't want to go to some stupid kid's party. Man, he could feel the rage burning somewhere down in his gut. The feeling of heat in his head and worms squirming inside his skull. He near threw himself down on his bed and punched the pillow with a snarl on his face till it went away. And then he kind of felt exhausted and frustrated with the world as he just kind of laid there until it was time to go down for supper. The next Monday, he got ready for his first day of school. Taking care not to be rough with the burn scars on his left side, he took a shower, grudgingly got his clothes on, and went down to eat breakfast. Eggs, waffles, bacon, and sausage. A nice meal. He liked all those things. But after he ate, there came the things he didn't like. A trio of medicine bottles. Celexa, Lexapro, and Wellbutrin. Antidepressant, anti-anxiety, and anger management. He hated taking the pills, but he knew he had a problem, so he took them. He could feel the anger crawling around inside him somewhere, but the drugs started acting on him pretty quickly now that he had been on them a while. Of course, this was just a dose to keep the levels in his system balanced. And he had forgotten to take them over the weekend. His mother had forgotten to make sure he didn't forget. He and his brother went outside to wait for the school bus. The stop was just a short way down the street, and there were already some local kids there, one they recognized as Billy. As they got closer, they could see Billy was upset, and the other three were talking to him. No, looked like they were teasing him or something. They were all a bit older than Jeff. One was a lot bigger, though. Great, thought Jeff. Just what I need today. The local bullies. Well, well, looky, looky what we got here, me pallies. Seems we got ourselves some newbie woobies. The larger boy spoke with an affected accent. The other two just smirked at how he was talking. Jeff assumed it was a joke, or maybe a reference to something they were all into. Tim, it just sounded retarded. Right, oh, scallywaggies. This here is the bus stop, and if you went on the bus without any... He paused and made a show of thinking... Accidents? You have to pay our little tolly woly. Right, right, Tommy boy. Right, right, Randy, one of the others said. One was kind of fat, but looked like he could rip any of the younger boys in half. A bulldog of a boy. The other one, Tommy, was tall and skinny, like breathing on him hard enough could knock him over. The third, Randy, looked like he had stepped out of a young teen romance novel. Built and already very handsome for his age. From his clothes to his manners, he had the feel of someone used to getting his way. Rich brat, in other words. Jeff decided to tell them where they could take their accident and shove it. Now, now, me boyo, no need for such artful language, he said, still speaking in that odd sing-song manner. Sounds like we have ourselves a little boy with a big man somewhere down in his goody woods. He smiled a very unpleasant smile at Jeff. Keith, show them how we negotiate. With that, he had dropped the act, and his tone was as ugly as his smile. The bulldog boy pulled a shiv out of his pants, paint handle with a bit of sharpened metal duct tape to it. At the sight of the weapon, Lou and Jeff froze. Jeff heard himself say, Are you serious? to them. Not even a question so much as just utter disbelief at the situation. Totally understandable. Randy moved forward and started going through their pockets and feeling them where he shouldn't. Lou started to cry after Randy had had his hand in his pocket for quite some time, and Jeff could really feel the anger rising up. So that was why Billy had been crying. The guy wasn't just a thug, he was also a perv, and now he was doing something nasty to his brother. Jeff yelled at him, Hey, you fucking pervert, get your hands off my brother, or I'm going to take that away from you, bitch, and shove it up your ass. Said, pointing at the kid with the shiv. 
Oh, rip. He didn't get a chance to finish. His Jeff punched him square in the face. Broken nose, check. Fractured jaw, check. Randy went down to his knees, clutching his face, and that was when all hell broke loose. Bulldog boy came running at Jeff with a knife and found himself laying on the ground face up because Jeff actually knew some judo and had managed to toss him over. The shiv went skittering off on the pavement and Skinny came and took a swing. Knocked Jeff in the side of the head pretty good, but he just didn't really have the muscle to do any damage. Jeff slammed him in the gut, which put him on the ground too. He heard Billy and Lou both yelling and turned around just in time to see Randy coming at him with the blade. Face already swelling up, and it was kind of a bloody mess. His nose looked about four times bigger. Jeff stepped to one side and tripped him, then walked over and kept, kicked him in the side a couple of times. Then he picked up the shiv and looked at it. Looked down at Randy and smiled. Kneeling down, he stuck his hand down Randy's pants and said, How about I take this from you? How does that sound, Randy, you perverted fuck? Oops. Let me read and do that, because I've written the last was a guttural snarl. You perverted fuck! There we go. Jeff, stop! Don't do anything crazy! It's over! We're okay! Just leave him alone and let's get out of here before the bus comes! Lou had a hold of his brother's arms, keeping him from slicing into what he had pulled out of the other boy's pants. Jeff looked blankly at his brother and finally nodded. He let go, dropped the blade, and the three boys ran off. That day at school, Jeff was worried all day. But that was it. It was strange. Enough so that it took him a while to figure out what was different. He wasn't angry. Not just because of the drugs, those only dulled the rage to a lower level. This was new. Different. He wasn't pissed off about anything. He was calm. That's how he had felt during the fight. Calm. And happy. He had really enjoyed it. Most of all when he had Randy at his mercy and was about to cut off his dick. He really wished Lou hadn't stopped him. He had kind of wanted to find out what that would look and feel like. And it lasted pretty much all day, a feeling of power and control. They walked home to avoid the bus. It had been pulling up as they had ran away and everyone had seen them. No one talked to he or Lou all day. And Billy's friends made a point of avoiding him. The school knew that something bad had happened they had decided the new kids were to blame. Jeff knew it was only a matter of time till the axe came down. But till then, he felt good. And he wanted to hold on to that as long as he could. The next day, he and Lou had had to go to the principal's office. Police officers and their parents were waiting. In the end, they were sent home. Jeff was in trouble for going too far, of course. People had seen him kick Randy and that he had done something else to him, but Randy and his little gang were known to be troublemakers. Billy had given a statement that held up their side of things. No one brought up the sexual assault or attempted castration. Jeff almost did, but when he saw the look on his brother's face, he stopped. Things were working out in their favor. No real reason to make it worse on them. In the end, they were almost heroes. Once the facts came out and got through the school gossip chain, Randy still had a few other buddies that might be a problem, but for the moment, Jeff and Lou were riding high. And he also found out a lot of people were coming to Billy's party, so maybe that wouldn't be so bad after all. I'm going to inject an interlude at this time before part three, because another problem I had with the original, and in fact, is continued on to, into my version is that what happens at the party is kind of an unrealistic and psychotic escalation of events. So, for my interlude, I'm simply going to say that use your imagination and consider that 
In addition to getting in trouble for what happens at the happened at the bus stop, Randy and his two pals also are going to be uncovered for their pervy assaults on other kids because now that Randy's been beat up, people aren't as afraid of him and a lot of uh, nasty things are coming out about what he and his buddies have been up to. Sexual assault of both boys and girls that they've come into contact with, theft, lots of different things. So, we're simply going to assume that due to this incident, Randy and his two buddies have found themselves in a world of trouble. They haven't been arrested yet, but it's obvious that it's only a matter of time before they are arrested <clears throat> and are going to be going to juvie, possibly because they're older, even to proper jail over all the crap they've been pulling. So now we have a proper setup for why they would have such an extreme reaction at the party, or rather why they would actually go to the party in the first place looking to cause so much trouble in front of so many witnesses. Part 3, The Party. That Saturday, Jeff woke up to his mother opening his curtains and saying his name. What? It's Saturday, Mom. What gives? Don't play that game with me, Jeffrey. Today is the party. It's going to be starting in a couple of hours, and you've slept most of the day away. So get up off your ass and go get ready. Grumbling teenager grumbles, he went and got ready to go to the party. When he got downstairs, he saw that his parents were going formal. She was wearing one of her really nice gowns, and he had on his party tux. Oh, come on, Jeff. This is supposed to be a nice party. Can't you find anything better to wear than that? She said in her best mother's scolding tone. Well, I could rather... I would rather go casual than show up overdressed, he retorted, not bothering to hide the snark in his voice. His father joined in. Hey, smartass, your brother put on a nice outfit without us having to tell him to. Now get up, back upstairs and find something respectable. It won't kill you to dress up a bit. He went over to him and kind of put his arm around him and said, Girls like a guy that can dress up sharp. He added and patted Jeff on the shoulder before giving him a bit of a push towards the stairs. In the end, Jeff settled on a pair of pinstripe black slacks, but he couldn't find any decent shirts. All he could find were shirts with a stripe going sideways, t-shirts with banded movie stuff on them, and, well, all he could really find was a white hoodie, so that's what he finally settled on, because that was the only thing that would go with the pants. As he came down the stairs, he heard his mother breathe out sharp in irritation, not unexpectedly. Oh, come on, Jeff, really? That's what you decided to put on? Do I need to take you shopping? I mean, you must be nearly out of clothes. What am I going to do with you? Mom, I tried to find something else, but all my shirts have the stripe going the wrong way, your bands and stuff on them. I'm not stupid. This was the only thing I could find that matched the pants. I still have that Hawaiian shirt from the vacation. You want me to go put that on? Rolling her eyes at him, she said, Oh, fine, whatever. We don't have time to go upstairs again so I can find you something. Now, come on, let's go. They walked over to Billy's house and knocked on the door. His mom opened it and welcomed them all. Fawned over how handsome the boys looked for a moment, then shuffled them all off to the backyard where the kids were, the boys. And the adults were inside. Pretty much all of them were dressed up. Jeff mentally shrugged and decided all adults were weird, not just his parents. The yard was a mix of kids of different ages. There were a few from school his age, most were a couple of years younger, Billy and his brother's age. There was also a scattering of little kids running around playing cowboys and Indians. Jeff socialized a bit, but even with his newfound cool status, he didn't really know anyone, so he became a bit of a wallflower. Then one of the little kids came up to him. Hi! It was a little girl, cute and infectiously perky as only little kids can be. 
Want to come play with us? You look sad and you should be having fun because this is a party and you are supposed to have fun at a party, okay? Jeff couldn't help but smile at her and went over to play with the kids. Before too long, everyone had joined in and teamed to talk. They were all having a good old time. Then things went kind of quiet and... Hey, Jeff. Lou nudged him. Look who's here. I didn't say that properly. Oh, well. He looked up and, of course, it was Randy and his gang. They had come in through the back gate and none of the adults had noticed. Jeff motioned for the little kids to get back out of the way. Hey, there are a lot of kids here, man. You want to get your ass kicked again, fine, but not here. You don't get to tell me how this goes down, fuckwad. Randy honked at him because... Ah, uh, fuck. You don't get to tell me how this goes down, fuckwad. Randy honked at him through his busted nose and mouth. Your name's Jeff, right? Well, Jeff, this... Cops really have an end for me because of you and that little cunt over there. He pointed at Billy. If I'm going to get locked up, I'm going to get my money's worth. At that moment, several of the parents came out of the house. You need to leave, Randy. No one wants you here. Shut the fuck up, old man. Randy screamed as best he could. Then his buddies pulled guns and pointed them at the kids. A woman screamed, and everyone went still. Listen. No, you listen. I'm going to teach this bitch a lesson. And no one is going to get in the way or my boys open up on your stinking brats. We're going to be put up on charges either way, so we ain't got nothing to lose. Randy rushed at Jeff and they both went down onto the ground. They rolled around trying to punch each other or grab onto something scrapping and eventually Randy got a hold of Jeff's hair and started smacking his head into the ground slamming it into the grass which really didn't hurt all that much but of course it didn't feel very good either Jeff finally managed to get Randy off of him by pressing his forehead against the boy's nose hard Jeff got to his feet and Randy followed holding his nose and glaring at Jeff with nothing but hate in his eyes. They circled each other slowly. Then they started throwing punches at each other. This time Randy caught Jeff with a wild haymaker. Made him drop like a stone. He just lay there on the ground dazed, trying to shake some sense back into his head, knowing how bad his position was. The first kick made something tear in his side. The second broke at least two ribs. Before Randy could lay another kick into him, man uh, Jeff managed to slam his arm wildly out into Randy's legs and make him stumble away. Jeff tried to get up to his feet, shaking, holding his side. Randy ran and kicked him in the side of the head, sending him slamming, slamming into the patio doors. They cracked under the force he had hit them with, and... He heard his mother screaming for help. Then Randy kicked him again and he blacked out. He came two moments later and was surprised to see furniture. Looking around confused, he realized Randy had kicked him through the patio doors. He could feel something wet on his face and his back felt loose. It felt really wrong. Randy followed him, followed him in and pulled him up on the off the floor, then sent him head first into a liquor cabinet. Jeff was numb. His eyes burned from the alcohol that splashed onto him from several broken bottles. Oh, come on. This is the same fucking bastard that beat us all up the other day? The great hero of Fairview High? Give me a fucking break. Come on, Jeff. Get up. Get up! Fight me, you little piece of shit. Jeff struggled to his feet. He wanted it to stop. He held up his hands, trying to tell Randy he had had enough. He felt strange, detached, not angry at all. Like during the other fight, but this time he was losing and it did not feel good. It sucked. He knew he was cut up bad, and he coughed for
from the stench of the alcohol. Well, looky here. Looks like Mr. Tough Guy wants to give up. Randy said in a hateful, mocking tone. Nope, Jeff, you don't get off that easy. I want to fight, and we're going to fight until one of us is dead. Suddenly, there was a loud bang outside. Jeff slowly looked over and saw Billy and his brother f both falling down. Skinny was looking at them with a shocked look on his face. Randy just laughed. <laughs> Looks like I'm getting all my birthdays and holidays at once, Jeff. Jeff screamed. He wasn't aware of the crying and screaming of Billy and his parents, of Billy and his... I kind of wrote that funny. The crying and screaming of his and Billy's parents. There we go. Everything suddenly went detuned and defused. All he could see was Randy. He leapt at the boy with a broken bottle and shoved it into his stomach. Randy was rather surprised by this development, by all accounting. He looked down and couldn't say a single word as he fell back. Jeff, or the demon wearing his skin as some would say later, stomped his foot down onto the bottle, then knelt down and started battering Randy's lifeless head. After a long minute or two of beating the boy's limp remains, he turned his gaze onto the two out in the yard. Everyone else was gasping, their sight fixed on Jeff. As bad as Randy's attack had been, this was pure savagery that Jeff had displayed. It was beyond the pale. Animalistic. He started moving towards them, the boys in the yard, but they started shooting, mostly missing. But several parents were hit. None were killed, thankfully. Jeff ran. He got hit once, but was far too gone to care. He ran for the stairs with the two boys running after him. They played a fast game of cat and mouse in the upstairs hall, Skinny and Bulldog firing until their guns ran out of ammunition. Both swore as Jeff ran into a bathroom and threw their guns down. They, they knew that without the guns, the adults downstairs would have no reason to stay back, so they had to finish this as quick as possible. Although both were starting to wonder just how the fuck they had let Randy talk them into this. They both pulled shivs from their waistbands and started into the bathroom after Jeff. Jeff had pulled a towel rack off the wall and was holding it like a bat as they came into the room. He swung at Skinny, who dodged out of the way, but he connected solidly with Bulldog. The boy grunted and fell to the floor. A pool of blood slowly formed where he had fallen, his eyes flickering, and after what seemed to be a very long time, stopped moving. Skinny lunged at Jeff, wanting to get closer so he could, couldn't swing the makeshift club properly. He got his hands on Jeff's neck. Both boys dropped their weapons and started grappling in the confined space, made even more so by the body of Bulldog. They stumbled and slammed into a shelf, knocking over a bottle of bleach that started leaking because the lid wasn't screwed on tight enough. Jeff was on top as they slammed onto the floor, and he started bashing into Skinny like a little hellion. After moments, although Skinny would later say it was a long time, Jeff pulled back away from him, exhausted. Skinny was battered like a piece of cod, but still alive and coherent. The two boys just stared at each other for a time. They heard people coming. Skinny started laughing as he pulled something out of his pocket. <laughs> Jeff senses it returned enough for him to ask, What are you laughing at? This was the reply as he held up a lighter and set up. You're covered in some pretty strong shit, Jeff. If you come any closer, I'll light you up like a bonfire. Jeff snarled at him and started moving towards him and Skinny popped open the old flint and steel lighter, struck it, and held it out as Jeff came at him. Jeff's hand reached for the lighter, and flames flickered into life, then raced up his arm. He tried to beat the fire down, but all that did was light up his other arm. Within moments, his whole body, upper body, was on fire, and he screamed and screamed and screamed. He stumbled back into the shelves, and the bleach busted open dousing him. 
and then everything faded out to black. Part four. Shh. Go to sleep. Jeff was still in the hospital. It had been almost a month since the fight. He had had a hard time of it when he first woke up, tube down his throat, IVs, ICU. He was messed up, bad, especially his face. No one would talk to him about his face. He remembered what had happened, and being a fan of the Batman animated series, he had the sinking feeling that he was playing the role of Two-Face in this particular production. His head was still wrapped up from the burns, they said. He was still only able to see blurry shapes, shadows against the glare of light. They had told him his eyes were burned by the alcohol and then by the fire and bleach. He wasn't going to be blind, they didn't think. But they weren't sure. He was mostly worried about what his face looked like. Can't necessarily say that Jeff was a vain boy, but at 13, starting off into the world of girls and high school soon, he was rather worried. Lou had survived getting shot. Billy hadn't. Unfortunately, Billy had taken most of the force of the shot, and Lou had only been wounded. It had passed through Billy and hit Lou. Jeff was glad Lou was okay, and he should feel sad about Billy, he knew, but he didn't. He was glad that he was dead instead of Lou. Burns are painful, and they take a long time to heal. Jeff already knew that from the last time he had been burnt. Back in his old school, he had gotten into a fight in science class and gotten pretty burned pretty bad all down its left side. That was why they had had to move in the first place. He had hurt the other kid pretty bad, and even though he had managed to not get put in juvie, no one wanted to deal with him there anymore, so they moved. Jeff spent a long time laying in that hospital bed, thinking. Something had changed in him during the fight, but he didn't know what. He wasn't going to face any charges, the police told him. There were more than enough witnesses backing up what he had done. It was self-defense. And if they left out a few details, oh well. Randy had pushed him to the breaking point and paid the price. Skinny ended up in jail. He had been tried as an adult and convicted. All these things passed, and then it was time to face the music. No one had talked to him about his face. The doctors had talked to his parents. He had overheard some of it. Unusual case. Had it needed skin, skin grafts on his face, but there were complications. Little scraps that didn't tell him anything. When they took off the bandages for good, the reaction was just what he was afraid of. His mother cried. His father tried to put on a brave face. His brother gasped and couldn't look him in the eye. He went into the bathroom and looked in the mirror. His lips were the first thing he noticed. They were an angry red, not the color of blood, but of badly healed burns. His eyebrows were just gone, making him look even more startled than he was. The effect was actually rather comical, and he began to chuckle. <laughs> they had remodeled his nose, but it was too flat, almost not there at all. His skin was rough and very, very pale. Except for around his eyes, there were charred rings there around his eyes. What hair had grown back was ratty and greasy looking, black, rather than the honey brown hair he used to have. His mother had always told him how beautiful his hair was. His family were startled when he started to laugh. <laughs> I'm the Joker. <laughs> it's perfect. This is who I really am. <laughs> An angry clown. <laughs> he just kept laughing and laughing and crying all at once. And this strange little joke faded played on him. Very worried, his parents spoke to the doctor, but he reassured them. He still uh, is on some strong painkillers, and this kind of reaction is pretty typical. 
he will need to see the psychologist till he comes to terms with how he looks, and of course, once he is fully healed, we can talk about plastic surgery. A few days later, it was time for Jeff to go home. He had been acting a bit off in the hospital, but everyone put it off on the shock, which is probably, it, probably true, probably was partially shock. However, no one took the time to do a proper psych eval on him. They sent in someone who was busy. Overworked, hadn't had enough sleep, hadn't eaten enough for lunch. Hey, we've all been there. And if he rushed through the interview faster than he should have, and was too distracted to notice some warning signs, we can still forgive him. Like I said, we've all been there, done that, at one point or another. You know, rushed a job for any number of reasons. So they took Jeff home, putting up with his strange smile, wide eyes that never seemed to blink, and ghastly appearance. Lou even joked with him that he could star in some horror movies now. Jeff just smiled wider and nodded like an eager six-year-old. For a few days, things were almost back to normal. They settled down. Jeff wasn't going to be going back to school for a long while, so he spent most of his days at home, staring at himself in mirrors and smiling at himself. Then, late in the night, nine days after his release, Jeff woke his parents up. He was in the bathroom crying and laughing again, very loudly. This had happened before, and his mother went to see what was wrong, see if she could comfort him. But when she got into the bathroom, she saw what he had done and stopped cold. Blood dripped down onto the sink from a pair of scissors in Jeff's face. He had used them to cut his face up into an obscene smile. Jeff! Oh God, Jeff, what are you doing to yourself? She moaned or cried in this case. <laughs> I wanted to keep smiling for everyone, put on a brave face, he started, blood mixed with spit flowing down his chin onto his chest. But I couldn't keep it up, Mama. It hurt to keep it up. Now I can smile all the time. Smile, smile, smile forever. He turned to the mirror and touched his face tenderly, caressing it. And I cut off my eyelids so I can keep looking at my lovely face. They got tired, so they had to go, Mama. He turned to look at her, and she saw what he had done, and she started backing away. What's the matter, Mama? He asked, an angry tone entering his voice. Don't you think I'm beautiful? Yes, Jeff, you're my little angel. You're always beautiful to me, she sobbed. Just stay there, Jeff. I, I, I need to get your father so he can take you to the hospital. She rushed into the bedroom and was telling Jeff's father, panicking, when she let out a grunt. Jeff was behind her with a scissor to, scissors and had stabbed her in the back. For a moment, pain and sadness flashed across his face, then the rage came again. You lied, Mama, you lied to me. I think it's best to not describe what he did to his parents and brother in details. It's best you don't try to imagine it either. However, I can guess what happened after he was done with his parents. It's only a guess based on the testimony of that boy that survived, and no one really takes me seriously. Too much of what I've told you is guesswork. But, it all fits when you step back and add the pieces together. Even if Jeff is supposed to be dead. I think his brother woke up and called out, not realizing what was going on. I think he probably shrugged it off and tried to go back to sleep, but heard something. Maybe he just felt a pair of unblinking eyes staring at him from the dark hallway. I think he started to get up, and Jeff grabbed him forced him back down and said something to him. Enough noise. Shh. Time to go to sleep. And I think this act destroyed whatever was left of Jeff, the 
poor young man with a anger problem. I think what left that house that night was Jeff, the killer. <laughs>